My name is Michael Hausenblas. I'm a Chief Data Engineer at MapArt Technologies. And what we do is we provide a big data platform. Uh, could also consider that as a Hadoop distribution. And part of our things we're, we're having there offering are what we call ecosystem components, um, spreading everything from HBase over to Solar. And um, in this context, uh, we quite often, you know, when we uh, engage with, with prospects or customers, come to that question, you know, what, what's actually a good choice here, right? And quite often we find that um, any kind of uh, Lucene-based solutions, uh, solar, um, is already in use. Um, so the question is, you know, can we push the, the boundaries there? Can we use solar for X, Y, Z? Um, and this led us to uh, submitting this session to trying to give you a bit of a guideline, a bit of a feeling for when solar is a good choice and when not. Uh, I'd like to keep that session rather interactive, so please do interrupt me at any point in time. Um, I'll plan to have a five to ten minutes um, Q&A at the end, but uh, yeah, if you want to discuss, share your uh, experience with, with uh, solar applications uh, and when to use it or when not to use it, uh, feel free. So that's what uh, we're going to talk about, uh, the sort of uh, positioning in the overall ecosystem, a bit of uh, my pet peeve, polyglot persistence, uh, looking at use cases, a little bit of a checklist, or my attempt of a checklist, and when not to use solar. And uh, just already as a spoiler alert, it's not an empty slide. There will be something on that slide. So um, I'm a bit restrained here, so I can't really do what I normally do. I go like have to stay here, so pardon me. Um, if you look at, uh, and I've confined it to the Apache um, ecosystem here, uh, there are obviously many more tools out there, be it on GitHub or wherever. Um, what you will find there conceptually are these two layers, the storage layer and the uh, processing layer. Now, uh, anybody of you could jump up and say, that's not true, it's, you know, it's not exactly like that, and uh, I'll give you that. I mean, it's... Um, you know, is, is solar, should solar be up there or should it be down there? It's at the end of the day also somehow managing something on disk, right? Um, however, there are certainly some frameworks or libraries where we can agree upon that they're probably more towards the um, storage end, like HDFS, the distributed file system that ships with Hadoop, um, or CouchDB, or whatever. And then there are more processing-oriented frameworks like anything that is uh, built atop of uh, MapReduce, uh, be it uh, Mahout or Hive, uh, Pig, and so on. And that is a bit like to give you an overview of where we are talking um, about solar in this big data context, right? Whatever big data might be. Any questions so far? Not really. Huh? So, polyglot persistence. Who of you has already heard about that? That's great. That's what I love. Wonderful. Um, to warm up a bit, a little quiz. Who can tell me what's the difference between the left side and the right side? How would you label the things that are on the left hand and on the right hand? If you can't really see it, it's Lego bricks, it's a toolbox, and the lower ones I believe you should be able to identify some things going on on the shelf. The right hand side, you have a wonderful hint, one size fits it all jumper or whatever, you have one of these one size fits it all, now I'm giving it away, right? Okay, so on the left hand side you have the toolbox approach, you're building up your stuff bottom up, having t small dedicated tools that fulfill a certain task, put them together, right? Or tool belt, toolbox, whatever you want to call it. Lego, right? L little Lego bricks and you can build whatever you like. On the right hand side, other, other way around from, from you, your view, um, you have these one-size-fits-it-all um, things, right? And that's actually not something I came up with. Um, much smarter people than, than I uh, came up with that already. Mike Stonebreaker, some almost 10 years ago, this one-size-fits-it-all paper where he um, somehow compared the uh, relational databases with um, dedicated bespoke uh, stream processing system that he built and evaluated. Martin Fowler coined this term polyglot persistence 
uh, in 2011, uh, kind of derived and motivated by this polyglot programming um, meme. And Eric Brewer, um, who also works at Google, um, gave a wonderful keynote last year at Recon. Um, and I really, I really encourage you to have a look at that. It's on Vimeo, uh, and the slide deck is also somewhere there. Um, essentially comparing these two approaches, right? So what is this really about? Um, the idea would be that you're, so, or it makes sense to use dedicated data stores and dedicated uh, query and lookup tools uh, depending on your needs. Um, so don't try to do um, any kind of workload with exactly one code base with one tool. Um, this can happen within an application or across the, the enterprise. Um, and the, the main challenge uh, that you can, can imagine if you are, for example, using um, an application MongoDB for some user profiles and you have some transactional data in, in a relational database and then you have uh, Solar for some faceted search or whatever, the problem there is a bit you're ending up with data silos, right? So you somehow need to make these different data silos talk to each other. So you need to find a, a sweet spot there on the one hand for the developers and also for the operational guys um, in terms of complexity and, and flexibility. So this somehow is supposed to set the scene here to get you in the right mood for what is coming up now. Any questions so far? Is that polyglot persistence idea not necessarily saying that you have to agree, but did you somehow get the idea what, what this is about? Okay. Um, so now we're going to look into use cases, and I'll start off with something simple. Uh, that's where good old solar is uh, currently used, and uh, everyone knows that, right? Basic keyword search, um, spell check, auto suggest, ranked stuff, faceted search, uh, more and more popular and spatial search applications, right? So you have these, at least from a, from a technical point of view, pretty straightforward areas where that's what a search engine or um, yeah, an indexer or whatever is, is, uh, is good at. Um, you uh, index a number of a collection of documents and you return something uh, based on top of that. The question is, and, and I believe there were at least two or three talks uh, during uh, this uh, Lucene revolution, uh, that essentially address this, what can we do beyond that? So imagine you already have invested in um, in solar on the one hand in terms of the technology, on the other hand in terms of know-how. That's the, the, the key point there. You, uh, you, know, you have people trained on the API and the tooling around that and so on. Um, you might ask yourself, where else can we use solar? Where else can we leverage our investment we have uh, done there? So the two use cases I'm going to talk about is uh, the first one is the, the search-based recommendation. Uh, I gave a talk about that uh, yesterday in, in greater detail, so I'll keep it simple here because it's an uh, introductory uh, class. Um, essentially, to, to uh, phrase it very, very um, plainly, uh, one of our customers is a very big uh, credit card issuer. Um, essentially has, that's the kind of given, the kind of uh, input data we have, um, the purchase history of their customers. And that's a pretty uh, substantial amount of data. Um, then you have the participating merchants in a certain region. You have their designations, you have their uh, special offers and so on. And they already had um, a system in place that was essentially built atop um, yeah, conventional methods, relation databases and stuff. And what they wanted to do is um, getting out the recommendations faster, more um, contextualized, meaning uh, rather than I send out to the three of you go out there to Dublin, you would probably um, hope or expect to get different recommendations based on your interactions, what your friends are doing or your preferences, uh, rather than just saying because you're in that area, you all three get the same recommendation. So these kind of high-level goals were very important. Also the throughput um, in terms of uh, giving the ever-growing amount of uh, transactions and uh, once this, this whole thing uh, caught 
caught up uh, more and more merchants would um, you know participate and, and deliver their data um, so the throughput overall throughput of the system was was quite pivotal increasing that throughput and how we solved that essentially um, and I don't expect uh, now everyone to understand every little bit but uh, roughly what, what is happening. You have the complete history. Uh, remember early on I mentioned um, all the, the transactions and so on. Um, and through Mahoot, which is also an Apache project, uh, machine learning library and framework, um, we did the so-called co-occurrence metrics, essentially um, calculating which things, which items uh, co-occure with other items. And uh, so derive the, the item metadata. Uh, that would then also directly drive uh, the, the solar indexing and uh, having, depending on the, on the scalability requirements, uh, N shards in general. And uh, once that's in there, uh, we can essentially reverse that and directly serve um, the web tier, the, the mobile app that, that is driven by that, um, taking a certain small user history um, for example, my movements and uh, transactions in the last day, for example, um, into account as an input um, and deliver these uh, very specialized and, and localized and, and contextualized recommendations. Um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it regarding this use case. Um, as you can see, um, solar here is a bit, you know, abused if you want, um, in the sense that uh, it's not really uh, used as a straightforward, you know, keyword or any other of, of the, the things I mentioned earlier on, but really realizes this recommendation engine together with, with the pre-computed value of uh, out of Mahout. The second use case, uh, different customer here, uh, log analysis. Imagine um, you have uh, logs can come in, uh, you know, 200,000 or even more log lines uh, per second. So you have to deal with a quite high uh, velocity here. Um, what you want to do, want to, want to realize is um, uh, multi-field search. And you want, uh, you have certain SLAs, uh, certain service level agreements around, um, yeah, what the delay might be. So in that case, it was uh, below 30 seconds. Um, in this setup, we were able to uh, index some 500,000 documents per second. I should probably show you how that looked like. So what happened in the, in the data ingestion phase, uh, the data, the, the 200,000 um, log lines per second would come in, we would have Kafka there. Um, Kafka is uh, as well an Apache, now an Apache um, project that essentially um, allows us to, to handle this input stream of, of the data without uh, losing any of these, these um, events there. We would then do a text analysis outside of Solar and actually store the raw documents um, outside of Solar, so not to, to overload uh, the shards there. And then we would do the, the, the indexing. Um, and then again, the same principle as in the, the previous use case, in the serving mode, if you want, um, we would uh, reverse that and Solar would essentially serve that together with the, the raw documents where we're needed uh, based upon a query. Um, it's a bit of a discussion point how real-time uh, the, the whole thing uh, really is. It was not a strong requirement uh, there in this case. Um, it was more about uh, the overall reliability and the, the failure uh, tolerance. And um, the nice property here again, um, you could essentially just increase the number of shards and um, with that match the, the load, uh, the overall load of, of, the, of the system uh, pretty easily in a very linear way. Any questions to this? use case specific things. Do you see a pattern some, somehow there dealing with big amounts of data, um, be it in a more um, yeah, static way or a more dynamic way? That's the overall direction. And there are many more um, that 
somehow follow, follow one of these patterns there. Um, essentially, the, the, the bottom line, if you look at these things, is um, solar um, alone would not, would not be able to fit the bill, but in combination with, um, for example, yeah, HDFS or a distributed file system in general, um, you are able to both address the velocity and the volume aspect of big data. So you can scale up to, uh, yeah, in one case, uh, half a petabyte um, of, of data and uh, a rather yeah, uh, high and, and sustainable uh, ingestion rate. Now, let's come to my attempt of a checklist, and I'm uh, more than happy to uh, discuss and extend that. I, I certainly see that this, this talk today as a, as a starting point and happy to um, gather your input and, and, and refine that uh, and, and yeah, work on that uh, to take into account other views. Uh, what I would suggest, uh, questions to ask uh, yourself or your customer or your boss, um, what's the overall volume of the data? That might sound um, straightforward, but uh, quite often, at least in my engagements when I'm discussing that with, with prospects or customers, it's everything else than, than clear, right? Someone says, ah, that's uh, just a couple of gigabytes. And I look at that and it turns out to be a couple of hundred terabytes or the other way around. Um, obviously, these you know few gigabytes or petabytes now, uh, that's a little footnote here, uh, taking Moore's law into account that something, you know, next year it might look different, right? But um, Nevertheless, currently, as we are speaking, um, you know, what speaks against uh, keeping a couple of gigabytes into just in, in memory, right? Nothing. Uh, you want uh, to have a look at um, systems like uh, Hazelcast, for example, uh, distributed memory grid, um, where you essentially leverage uh, the combined uh, RAM of, of, a, of a cluster of machines. So. If this is an option, if the data set size actually fits in memory, why not doing it there? However, as I said, and motivated by, by the two uh, earlier use cases, you do have quite often um, a rather big amount that uh, doesn't fit in, into memory. So you have to somehow uh, deal with that uh, on hard drive or increasingly uh, flash or SSD. Does any one of you already have SSD-based systems in production or evaluating that? I'd be very interested in that if anyone... Anyone knows what SSD is? <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. Um, so if anyone has um, wants to share some experience here also after 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 the talk offline, I'd be very interested in. Um, so that, that's one of the, the first questions. It's an obvious one, but uh, finding, finding a, a good answer to, to that and, and based on that, uh, already having an idea in which direction to go is, is worthwhile. Um, in, in parallel, I would typically ask myself, or a customer, or whatever, um, how are the, the query characteristics? And I, I don't you know, care if you say look up, query, or whatever. Um, you get the idea, right? Is it uh, in terms of workload, in terms of, of um, what is happening there? Is it more of a full scan of the entire data set? Uh, are there specific lookups? Is it something like you have machine learning, um, quite often multiple passes over um, large parts or even the entire data set? Um, could be continuous queries. So if you have streams, what you're essentially doing is rather than um, having the data there and firing off queries, you have the query which is fixed and you just let the the data stream pass by. So the, the queries would be the thing that would uh, stick around and the data would just flow by. Uh, and it obviously could be a, a combination thereof, right? You, you could have um, historical data. Um, think of a simple case like uh, if you have the weather, you might have, uh, both in Europe and US, you have a quite good record of, of uh, up to the last 100 years of um, you know how exactly the weather was in each of, of the cities or whatever. So that might be the, the historical part. Um, and then you have uh, live streaming data from the weather stations, and you want to combine this historical data with um, with the data that, that streams in. Um, so, so to say, it's not you know 
either of these four options, uh, but it, it could be a combination thereof. And in order to understand into which direction um, to move and if solar is a good fit or not, um, having that in mind uh, helps a lot. One uh, last question that sometimes in my experience, um, because the, the difference between throughput and latency is not that obvious to everyone, let's put it that way. Um, but I, 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 I try to, to elicit this information from, from customers also. Um, what matters more to you? Um, sometimes the answer is I don't know, but uh, fair enough. Um, so as I said in that one um, use case, there the overall throughput, uh, that, was a, that was the hard part, that was the hard requirement. Um, then there are a number of uh, use cases if you think about um, you know, your mobile phone or web applications or whatever, um, where the latency obviously is, um, is you know, users don't want to wait and, and, this long, and as soon as they start to wait for 10 seconds or whatever, they get nervous and think the, the web application is broken or whatever. So um, there are the questions also, uh, throughput obviously is, is, a, is a global thing, right? You can, uh, tell, you know, in terms of utilization, throughput, the, the overall system is, is doing well. Latency, it's a bit more tricky because uh, it could mean that, you know, the three guys here, uh, you have a perfect latency, but unfortunately everyone else around here, 250 or 300 other people, um, uh, yeah, for, for them the latency is three times as, 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 as worse, uh, as bad. And uh, so the question here really is, what, what, how do you measure latency? Um, do you take an average latency or uh, percentiles or whatever. But at the end of the day, uh, in order to, to decide uh, what to use there, I would, would need to have a good understanding of, of what is more important or yeah, this kind of, I don't know. Now let's look at um, some, what I would call key qualifiers to decide if, um, so that's not, now we're in the, in the positive phase, here you should, uh, I can really recommend you to use solar without a, a second thought, right, if you want it that way. Um, as you might know, and I had a very nice discussion yesterday um, around the topic uh, aggregations, that's something where search engines in general and uh, solar is special, they're not really good at, at that, right, at aggregating stuff. There are uh, what I would call lightweight aggregations uh, done via facets, so you can do, you know, group things into categories or whatever, saying, okay, these are all, um, here are the cities, or whatever the facet might be. Um, but then there are a number of, of aggregates that don't really easily, or I, I don't really see how they, they map. Uh, and, uh, as I gather, there, there are, there's some, some work going on there, um, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure how how hard this first point is in terms of aggregates, but in general, you can you can uh, say that if your interface don't necessarily think of, of uh, you know the, the UI as such, but uh, any any kind of interface really is more of an um, explorative um, thing than um, in, in contrast to to, to aggregates, um, then then uh, yeah, uh, this is a, a very good qualifier for for solar. Uh, one of these basic assumptions, uh, I'm not sure if you, uh, you know, are aware of that, but uh, essentially it's there, um, is that the data, the characteristics of the data, is that it's a rather sparse thing, right? We have a sparse uh, symbol set. Um, yeah, recommendation indicators is, is one of these examples. Um, so that's something where I would assume by looking at, at uh, the characteristics of your data, you should be uh, able to tell um, if that's applicable to you or your, your use case. Um, one other thing, um, which is, is not only true for, for solar, but also um, for a number of, of for example, um, these, uh, the new generation of uh, SQL on, on Hadoop um, query engines, be it Drill or Impala or Facebook recently uh, released Presto and plenty of more. Um, that again, there is a kind of built-in assumption that the resulting, the, the result set size essentially, um, uh, are, is rather small. Um, and yeah, if that's the case, then again, this is a very good qualifier. And 
again, also tie, tying back to the, to the aggregates, um, the facets doing a good enough job to, to keep up with that. Uh, regarding near real time, um, I must be honest with you, I'm not that much of an expert uh, uh, in solar regarding the, the, the near real time thing, so I wouldn't be able to uh, argue that through to what extent uh, this near real time module is, is uh, you know, what, what good enough uh, means uh, in that context, but uh, I think we can agree upon that uh, you you need to invest a bit of uh, effort to get uh, to, a, to a point where you can call that you know, real-time um, as, as seen in other um, systems there. So this would be the point in time where I ask, does anyone else in the room, if you're probably not uh, so much of a beginner but uh, have a bit of an experience here, has any suggestions for other qualifiers that you would see being applicable, where you say that's really a good case for solar. Okay, then you're in the right class. You're in the beginner class. Very good. Um, and that leads me already to my uh, last topic, and that is when not to use solar. And as I promised you, it's not an empty slide. Um, there are a number of what I would call red flags that um, if you find these things, if you hear about that in, in the context of someone says, oh yeah, we should totally use solar for that, you might reconsider. Uh, as you might know, solar uh, in the distributed setup uh, is eventually consistent. Um, that's per se not a problem, but you might have a, a use case that requires strong consistency. Um, then the question is still, um, are you essentially screwed? Well, it's recorded, so are you essentially um, yeah, screwed. Um, you know, are you forced to going back to a relational database with ACID semantics or whatever? Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to immediately suggest alternatives here. It's really just about the awareness solar uh, in a distributed uh, setup is eventually consistent. And if you have these ACID uh, requirements, then you might want to, well, or you might might want to introduce this in, in an application level, but you can't really um, rely or depend on, on solar in that, set, in that sense. Uh, joins, uh, again, something where I've seen and heard uh, last two days a uh, bit of discussions around that. Uh, I don't know how, how familiar you're with that. Uh, I, I would believe joins in uh, relational set, setup you, you, you have heard about uh, already. Uh, yeah, it's uh, again, if, if you have uh, a star scheme or whatever and, and are required to have a lot of joins, uh, it's probably something where uh, solar might not be the, the, the best case for it. Um, there is, again, and, and most of these things, if you think about that, pretty much sound very uh, RDBMS-ish, right? So things like uh, strong consistency, which is easy to realize on a, on a, on a single node, uh, joins and also the, the complex transactions, um, where you could argue, okay, you're not going to build that uh, directly within solar, but uh, on a different tier. Uh, but again, just to highlight that, um, that's probably a red flag where I wouldn't, wouldn't want to suggest uh, solar. Um, or any any um, Lucene based uh, or any search engine for what it's worth. Um, there are cases uh, where I would consider it uh, a bit borderline, uh, OLTP and, and streaming. Uh, I've shown you earlier on uh, that it works and it works very well. Uh, the reason being why it works is essentially, and that's the only 10 seconds where I'm I'm doing a, a plug for, for the company I'm working for because it works on top of our uh, big data platform that essentially provides you with a very um, yeah, high throughput and, and reliable uh, data platform. Um, in general, you might want to uh, consider if, if, again, if, if the streaming and, and OTP use case is really uh, the best for it. And the last that, that came to mind, and we were again, had a discussion yesterday and Grant mentioned it as well, um, is it the right fit for, for graphs? Uh, I gather there are uh, a number of, of uh, attempts at that. Uh, 
to make it uh, work. Uh, I don't know of an example, uh, you know, at scale, uh, where a rather complex graph, let's put it that way, this this typical operation in graphs, graph traversal, um, finding shortest path or whatever, um, where solar um, has been deployed successfully uh, at scale. Um, and tying back to what I said initially, now you might uh, realize why I introduced this uh, polyglot persistence meme earlier on. I remember what I suggested there, one size does not fit at all, which means think twice if you're tempted to solve each and any kind of problem um, with one tool, and it doesn't matter if that one tool is a relation database of solar. Uh, I understand, that's what I, my motivation is, that if you have solar already in production or experience in solar, that you want to use it for other uh, use cases, you want to leverage your investment. However, um, yeah, think about the alternatives, and, and I hope that these two slides, the, the qualifiers and the red flags, somehow help you to decide on the positive and negative uh, scale, um, end of the scale, to uh, decide if, if solar is the right tool. And one last thing, I'd really like to love to stay in touch with you guys on uh, Twitter, um, um, yeah, or talk to me right after the talk. Uh, and we're hiring, so if you're interested in working with a, a cool startup and uh, being able to use and deploy solar in, in different setups, uh, talk to me, and uh, I have my business cards with me, so you can take that as well. All right, so we have some 10 minutes or so left, 15 minutes even for uh, questions. No, it was on. It's on. Hello? Yeah. Um, for the log processing system, so if we look at it, smaller applications where we don't want to build a huge solar cluster just to do log processing for one application, you know, should we look to store aggregates? You're saying maybe lean away from solar if you're looking to store aggregates. You know, should we aggregate the log data on the way in, or should we try and store it all? And, and you know, what did you do for that system that you built? Right. So, as any good engineer, I would say it depends. Uh, and and uh, please, please understand that what I said was really in the context of big data. So we're de really dealing with very large amounts of, of uh, data, high volume, heterogeneity and so on. Um, what I would probably do without knowing the specific of, of, of your use case, um, I would, uh, especially if you have um, aggregates like, you know, you want to have the, the average income of a... Um, Custom, uh, of an employee or whatever, um, numerical stuff like that. Um, I would probably leverage, uh, yeah, or, or do that outside uh, directly. Um, as I said, also in this case, you know, there was a reason why we did the the raw documents outside here, right? And the thing is, quite often, um, what looked good at on, on the paper in the first place, uh, once we, we built a system and would do two or three uh, test runs with that, uh, might not turn out to be the, the optimal solution depending on, on the requirements there. Um, so as long as you have uh, the data and, and the, the requirements around that uh, available, and to be honest, that's one of the problems that I often see that uh, the data is not available or not, not in that uh, way or format that uh, is, is you know envisioned or promised at that point in time where we're just about to you know build a pilot or a demonstration or whatever um so i would i would in, in general try to do this kind of aggregates as i said without knowing exactly what your use case is but uh, outside of solar and and uh, as i said there are also, as I learned in the last uh, couple of days, uh, a number of, of new things apparently coming up. I, I don't know when they will find their way into, into core or when they will be, you know, part of the official um, platform. Uh, but that's that's something where I think it would make sense to uh, evaluate these new components, plugins, whatever it, it is uh, the community develops. Um, in a staging area, in a, in a development area, to um, at least have a baseline. You know, you, you do it currently, 
the aggregates outside of solar, and then you have a baseline you can measure against. That's that's one of the things that when I talk with people and ask about baselines and if they're not there, how are you supposed to measure something, right? If if I don't know what is what is the baseline for that system, what, what do you currently have, right? Um, that's that's why I would suggest to do it in the first place um, outside and and but keep an eye on on, on these things uh, and and uh, trying trying to evaluate them with with the real data in a, in a development environment to to have a, a feeling. It could well be that they um, and that's that's the the challenge a bit I see. Um, as long as you're staying, uh, staying uh, below a certain scale, it might well work. But as soon as you're hitting, you know, could be the ingestion rate, could be the overall amount of documents or whatever, um, these things break down, and, and no one, no one is able to tell you when when that will be. Right? You, you simply need to go through that and, and uh, test that. Um, and uh, so we we often have these uh, syntactic uh, generators to because. We don't have access to, or uh, due to regulations or whatever, the data can't leave the country or whatever. Um, to just you know uh, have a synthetic workload that essentially just on the one hand stresses the system, on the other hand uh, gives us a bit of an idea uh, to identify bottlenecks or or you know uh, things that we kind of kind of this this profiling step. To, to see where in the in the overall workflow we might want to uh, start replacing stuff and, and uh, if it's something obvious like that that's why I have it in, in, in the list um, I would probably play it safe especially if it's a business critical thing uh, if I'm more in a you know research environment or environment where I'm allowed to play around that's not directly uh, deployed into production um, I would probably be a bit more aggressive and, and directly use this, uh, these new uh, features there. Uh, but yeah, in general, I would, to sum up, I would, uh, I would certainly suggest to, to do that outside of solar for now. Any other questions? Everyone looking forward to the party. All right. Then uh, again, uh, thank you very much. And do not forget, get in touch. Thank you.